In the previous episode of our series on Ottoman history, we covered the beginning of the war between the Ottomans and the Holy League, and the conquest of Cyprus by the generals of Sultan Selim II. But that wasn't the end of the war. The Ottomans, inspired by a relatively easy takeover of the crucial island, were planning campaigns in the heart of the Mediterranean, which led to the iconic Battle of Lepanto. Cyprus now belonged to the Ottomans, though it would be two months before news of Famagusta's fall reached the Holy League. Despite the fact that the alliance with Spain had allowed Venice to purchase grain from Spanish Sicily cheaply, this source simply could not cover losing access to the produce of Egypt, and famine choked their maritime empire. They hoped that Sokolu Mehmed Pasha, who had long collected bribes from Venice, might help, but the vizier's influence was at an all-time low, so this hope was misplaced. In 1571, the Ottoman fleets roamed with impunity, mercilessly raiding Venetian islands on the Ionian Sea, setting the stage for the battle both sides had been hoping for in the previous year. The Ottomans sought to consolidate their conquests in the Balkans with the capture of Kitaro in northern Dalmatia before the end of the campaign season but were forced to withdraw after a short failed siege. Their fleet initially took shelter in Greece from the coming winter storms, but an order received on September 9th from Sokolu Mehmed Pasha in Constantinople ordered it back to sea. Sokolu Mehmed Pasha wished Kataro taken immediately. The fleet would winter not at Lepanto, but at Kataro. There was only one problem. The Holy League fleet had not been idle and had pursued Ulucali's raiders from the North Adriatic to Greece. By the time Sokolu Mehmed Pasha's order arrived, the Holy League fleet had reached Otranto and stood between the Ottomans and their destination. If the fleet was to reach Kataro, it would need to overcome the 206 galleys and six heavy Venetian galleasses of the combined fleet, one of the largest navies assembled since antiquity. However, while seeking battle had not been his initial intent, Murzin Zedi Ali Pasha was confident. His fleet was larger, at 278 ships to 212, and thus far the Ottomans had been victorious in nearly every major naval battle they had participated in. In addition, Captain Karakodja, another raider, had misreported the Holy League fleet as being much smaller than its true size after his reconnaissance. The Ottomans began to mobilize soldiers and rowers to replace those that had departed, with confusing and contradictory orders costing them most of a month. By the 3rd of October, as the Ottoman ships remained in port, the Holy League fleet reached Kefalonia. On the 6th, they scouted out the Ottoman fleet and left Kefalonia for the Kutsalari Islands. On the 7th, as the Ottoman fleet sought to leave the Gulf of Patras for the open sea, the two fleets came together in what would be immortalized as the Battle of Lepanto. In the center of the Holy League fleet was Don Juan's flagship, La Real, nearly half again as long as an average galley at 60 meters. The center was where the Holy League was strongest, with 24 of the larger western galleys backing Don Juan and with the large but slow Venetian galleasses arranged ahead of the fleet to bombard the approaching Ottomans. Not counting the galleasses, the Holy League center counted 66 ships, the strongest of the three detachments. However, they also faced off against a very strong Ottoman center, with Mozin Zadi Ali's flagship, the Sultana, leading the great Turkish armada. As Muzinzada was more of a land commander and lacked the disgraced Piali Pasha's naval skill, he had concentrated much of the Ottoman strength, 87 ships, in a double center line, rather than taking advantage of his larger fleet to outflank the Christians. The 54-ship left wing of the Holy League fleet was primarily comprised of smaller Venetian line galleys under the command of Barbarigo, the Venetian quartermaster general of the sea. Mehmed Sirocco, the Bay of Alexandria, faced him on the Ottoman right. Sirocco had positioned his ships in an arc to better flank the Christians. 
However, with only 58 ships, his command was much smaller than the center or the Ottoman left under Ulugh Ali, meaning his arc stretched the single line of galleys worryingly thin. The Holy League right, finally, was under the command of Jan Andrea Doria and counted 50 ships. This theatre of battle most favoured the Ottomans. Ulugh Ali had brought a sizeable fleet of corsairs with him from Algiers to add to the regular Ottoman navy, leaving his wing greatly oversized at 101 ships. In preparation, both commanders led their flagships in prayer before a crucifix on Larial and an ornate Sufi banner on Sultana. Muazinzade Ali Pasha also addressed the rowing slaves before battle was joined, promising them freedom if the Ottomans should be victorious. Finally, the silence of the two fleets was broken by a cannon firing from Sultana. Though well out of range, the noise carried to the Holy League fleet and its meaning was clear. The battle had begun. When the battle was joined, the wind was blowing from the east, spurring the Ottoman ships forward to meet the Holy League. The four galleasses ahead of the Christian center, slow and heavy ships normally used in defensive operations, fired several powerful volleys into the Ottoman fleet as it approached, sinking several galleys, while the lighter guns of the Ottoman ships remained fairly ineffectual. The much higher decks of a galleus also made it difficult to board, negating the Ottoman numbers advantage as the Ottoman fleet swarmed around the larger ships. However, despite their intimidating size, the role the galleuses played in the larger battle is questionable. Early in the battle, the wind shifted, eventually carrying the clumsy galleuses past the parted Ottoman lines, after which they were hardly in a position to participate. On the Holy League's left, Mehmet Sirocco led his smaller galleys in a daring flanking action. Though this arm of the battle was close up against the shore, the shallower draft of the Ottoman galleys allowed them to safely traverse the sandbars to get around their Christian opponents. With greater numbers, this tactic might have been effective. However, four ships of the Holy League vanguard were quick to reinforce Barbarigo's contingent, quickly followed by another nine ships from the reserve. This tilted the numbers in favor of the Christians, and Sirocco's ships, spread thin, found themselves surrounded and overwhelmed individually. Cut off from the rest of the Ottoman fleet, the Ottoman right was now trapped between the reinforcing Christian ships and the shore. The fighting was brutal though, and with fewer of the professional Spanish tercio on this Venetian-dominated flank, it was very costly for both sides. Barbarigo fell to an arrow through the eye as he raised his helmet's visor to shout orders over the din. Marino Contarini, his nephew and part of the reinforcing vanguard, fell not long after, though not before crippling Sirocco's flagship. But their deaths did not go unanswered long. Another of their kinsmen, Giovanni Contarini, sank Sirocco's flagship, plucked the injured captain from the water, and executed him by beheading as the Ottoman right wing routed. In the center, Muazinzadi Ali Pasha brought his flagship straight on to grapple with Larial. This mentality, akin to an honorable battlefield duel, was unfortunately unsuited to the realities of this brutal naval combat. The collision of Larial and Sultana marked the beginning of one of the bloodiest engagements in the whole battle, as several galleys from each side pulled up along the stricken flagships to unload their soldiers into the fighting. However, despite the skill and bravery of the Ottoman soldiers, the Spanish and Genoese Tercio infantry were better suited to the battle at hand. The final nail in the Ottoman coffin was that, similarly to the battle by the shore, Many of the ships of the Ottoman center had split from formation to find gaps in the Holy League lines in an attempted envelopment, but without sufficient numbers, a tactic such as this merely allowed the foremost ships to be overwhelmed in detail. Had the battle in the center lasted long enough for Ulochali to break the outnumbered Christian left, the day might still have been won for the Ottomans. But after two hours of heavy fighting, Murzinzada Ali lay dead, Sultana captured, and the exquisite Ottoman banner had been made a trophy on Larial. 
the Holy League's right, led by Jan Andriodoria, had the most difficult task of all. They faced an enemy that outnumbered them two to one, led by one of the most talented Ottoman admirals at Lepanto. Here, Christian losses were severe, with no survivors on several galleys and terrible casualties throughout the outnumbered fleet. Battle was joined later here than in the center, and Sultana and Lariel were already locked in battle when Doria engaged. But while the Venetian chroniclers would vilify Doria for his cautious approach to the battle, the Genoese and Spanish galleys, as well as a small contingent of Maltese galleys that helped check Ulicelli's advance, performed far better than their Venetian counterparts in the frantic fighting. In addition, as the Ottoman goal was for the oversized left to break through and flank the Holy League's center, every delay was to the advantage of the Christian fleet. When the fleets met, the outer Venetian squadron broke and scattered. Unfortunately for the Ottomans, by this time the battles in the north and center were essentially won for the Holy League, and as Ulucali broke through the Christian lines to loop around behind the center, he saw that numerous galleys, including the Lariel, were now bearing down on him. Even worse, with the wind blowing from the west, 30 of his ships that still remained mobile and unengaged were now trapped. Eight managed to escape, including Ulucali, rowing hard into the wind with the Christians pursuing. Behind them lay the wreckage of what had yesterday been the most formidable fleet in the Mediterranean, as surrounded ships and pockets of Ottoman resistance were wiped out or surrendered. Ulic would manage to round up the rest of the escaped Ottoman ships, and would return to Constantinople with 87 in total, but most of the great Ottoman armada was destroyed or captured in the span of four brutal hours. The Holy League's victory can be explained by a number of sizable advantages they had. The Ottoman fleet was equipped for an amphibious assault, and the Holy League fleet held an almost two-for-one advantage in guns. The carnage of Lepanto was gruesome and terrible. Even for the victorious Holy League, the battle had been bloody, with over 8,000 dead. The Venetians had suffered the worst casualties, and had brought the largest fleet to Lepanto. On the Ottoman side, some modern estimates run as high as 40,000 dead outright. Lepanto had been one of the bloodiest battles of the era. When news of the victory at Lepanto reached Christian Europe, it was met with shock and elation. The scale of the victory gave new weight and importance to Pius V and the papacy, giving hopes that the perpetual Holy League signed in May might finally turn back the Ottoman conquests in Europe. The Panto was immortalized in poetry and painting as the pivotal battle of Islam against Christianity. But for all the glory Lepanto brought, its actual impact on history was not immediately seen, as the Holy League failed to follow up on their victory. Two years later, the death of Pius V caused Venice to sue for peace and for the League to dissolve. Venice lost Cyprus and was forced to pay a war indemnity. Our series on Ottoman history will continue, so make sure you are subscribed to our channel and have pressed the bell button. We would like to express our gratitude to our Patreon supporters and channel members who make the creation of our videos possible. Now you can also support us by buying our merchandise via the link in the description. This is the Kings and Generals channel and we will catch you on the next one.